Okay, uh, maybe we can get started. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Caesar, and uh, what we have today is a panel. And the topic of the panel is how to succeed in graduate school. So the motivation for this is that graduate school is a very different experience than undergraduate. It can be a very fun experience and something you can learn a lot from. Uh, but often what you do is very different than what you do when you're an undergraduate. And so what you need to do, how your progress is measured and so on are often very different as well. So we'll be talking about that. And we have an amazing panel here. Um, people who have been amazing grad students themselves, but have also produced very amazing grad students and really know the key to success. We have Jennifer Rexford, who's the Gordon Wu Professor of Engineering and the Chair of Computer Science Department at Princeton. Before joining Princeton, she worked for eight years at at and Labs. She is an ECM Fellow and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering. We have Edmundo de Souza Silva. He served on the ACM Symmetrics Board of Directors. He's the chair of the IFIP Working Group on Computer System Modeling. He's a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering and received the National Order of Scientific Merit Medal in Brazil. We have David Patterson, who is a professor at UC Berkeley. He developed the RISC computing architecture used by 99% of all modern processors. He won the AM Turing Award, which is widely considered as the Nobel Prize of Computer Science and wrote multiple textbooks that are extremely widely used in computer science education. And we have Anya Feldman, who's the professor of network architectures at Telecom Innovation Laboratories at TU Berlin. She serves on the supervisory board of SAP and is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Informatics in Saarbrücken. And we also have a student co-panel consisting of students from across the world. We have Lin Chen, Sanula Manzur, Mary Hogan, Amanda Su, Safana Mohammed, and Wael Fateh. Um, so this is the, the panel. Uh, before we start, we wanted to mention that this is actually a regular talk series. We have talks every two weeks. And the next talk is going to be on the topic of emerging trends in artificial intelligence and machine learning and their implications for networking research. And you're all welcome to come to that talk and future talks as well. So we're going to start the panel and you're all welcome to participate. Um, we're watching for questions on the Slack and on the Zoom. Instructions for joining the Slack have been mailed out to you. Uh, so you can post questions on either one. Um, and we wanted to start off with a question for the panel. So panelists, could you please each of, us, each of you tell us if you could give two pieces of advice to grad students, what would those pieces of advice be? What are the two most important pieces of, of advice you think for, for grad students to know? And you can talk in any order. I'm happy to start. I mean, so much about research is creating and communicating ideas. And so I would say the, first, the two pieces of advice are related to that. One is to, to write and speak often, to get practice and training in, in writing and speaking effectively, because that's gonna be such a big part of making sure your own ideas are honed properly and that you can get feedback on the ideas from others. And that's the second piece of advice is to really get feedback early and often as well. I mean, what's great about grad school is it's highly efficient. You're working at your own pace on problems you're excited about and learning by doing and by getting concerted feedback on the work that you're doing. And so getting that feedback early and often is really valuable too, so you can move more quickly to, to make your ideas better and, and polish them more. Let me jump in then. So I think graduate school is a time when you really have a chance to focus in depth on a specific problem. But don't get too, too carried away. Look around, look to see, hey, what kind of techniques could I use in order to apply it? What is a new way of looking at? Enjoy working with other people, discuss it, get, get feedback. Don't hesitate to talk to other people about your problem. And while you're doing this, still keep alive besides your work by. So keep a balance between your work life and your normal, regular life. For example, in my spare time, I go horseback riding because the big advantage is when I'm with the horses, I can't think about computer science. And in some sense, after returning from that, I'm often so much more productive than I would be if I had just spent extra time in the office staring at the problem. So take time off to be productive.
Edmundo, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Uh, so hello to everyone. And uh, I would say, if you ask me what's the most important, one question, in my case, I'd say you have to love what you are doing. You have to enjoy what you're doing. And I went to graduate school. I, I knew that I'd like to learn and uh, uh, learn new things. Uh, I, I changed fields, in fact, during graduate school because I found that the fields were, uh, that were, uh, I'd like to learn more. So I, I took more class. But most of all, this willingness to, to learn, this, uh, uh, the love that you have, that you put in what you are doing, uh, makes you. Uh, uh, your life less stressful. It's it's stressful. You have to uh, deadlines, go to deadlines and, and study. But once you like what you're doing, once you feel like to study, that goes much easier in your life. So love what you're doing. That's the most important thing. Uh, don't go if you don't like to study, don't like to learn new things. Go if you love to do it. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, like uh, a lot of computer scientists, I can't give a talk without slides. So I'll try and do that to the end. So I'm one of the things I'm known for is uh, bad advice. Uh, and so I, I, I give a talk on how to give a bad talk, how to have a bad career, and I have advice on how, how to have a bad graduate student career. And because uh, I've seen a lot of them. And then, um, and then, if you don't want to have a bad student, grad student career, I'll give you an alternative. So, and I'm doing this as commandments. Like I have commandments for a bad talk, how to be a bad professor. This commandments, four commandments of how to be a bad grad student. So the first one is concentrate on getting good grades. You want to postpone research involvement as soon as, as as long as you can, because you don't want it to hurt your grade your grade point efforts. Your goal is to be the PhD class valedictorian, right? Number one in your class. Now, okay, that's the bad advice. The alternative is, well, just grades don't matter that much. You, you don't wanna get terrible grades, but just get reasonable grades. Nobody cares about your grade point average. No one will ask you when you get your PhD, what was your GPA? And sorry, there's no valedictorian. You, you can't be that. Uh, I think in my career, I once gave one grad student a grade lower than a B. That's out of thousands. Right? So what matters is, when you graduate, is letters of recommendation. Um, you'd be maybe surprised how important it is. But it's from three or four faculty who've known you for years, and some people outside, because they may not trust the faculty. So what is going to matter is not your grades, but the letters of a recommendation that you're going to get. Okay. How to have a bad career, second commandment, graduating as fast as possible. Uh, the winner of the class is the first to get their PhD. Everybody else is a loser. So they only care if you have a PhD and your grade point average, it's not what you know, it's just, you know, you have a PhD. So don't take time off and work in industry because that'll slow you down. It'll take longer if you just work all summer. And you know, in, what does industry know about research, right? You, you just want to do that as fast as planned. Or, you know, how are they going to help with letters? Because, you know, you won't be at the university. You don't want to work on large projects because it takes longer to get the PhD and you won't win. You won't be the first to graduate. On these large projects, you have to talk to other people. You have to learn different areas. And again, that'll take time. And whatever you do, don't do a systems PhD because systems PhDs take longer than more theoretical PhDs. All right. But you know, the alternative advice, if you don't want a bad career, is this is your last chance to learn, uh, mostly outside of the classroom. Once you graduate, you're going to be pretty much on your own educating. And you're in this environment where all these people want to teach you, really great teachers, really great opportunities to learn things. The way it works is when you get a PhD, you're newly minted. You're reborn. You're a PhD. You're, you will be a PhD 2025. Uh, there's no youth credit. For PhD. You're not like a 25 year old PhD or a 27 year old PhD. You got your PhD this, and, the, and the clock resets with your PhD. So it's and so a way to think about it, if you're in your 40s, 50s or 60s or 70s, somebody's 26, somebody's 28. That's about the same. 
and they can't tell the difference between those ages, but it can make a really big difference whether you take a little bit longer to learn as much as you can. Third commandment, don't go to conferences. It costs money, it takes time, it might delay your graduation. You can't be the first to graduate. And you can learn the field after you graduate, after all. The alternative, this is your chance to see firsthand what the field is like and where it is going. Uh, you, and going to the conference, you can talk to people in the halls as well as listening to the talks. And if your advisor won't pay, then you should pay it yourself. Uh, going to conferences is so important, it's an extraordinary experience. So one of my colleagues who's now at Stanford, his advisor wouldn't pay for going to conference, so he paid for it for, out of his own pocket, and that was great advice. You know, there are students' rates for conferences, you can share a room, and these days with the quarantine, now you can attend almost for nothing, any conference. You don't get the hallway conversations, they're working on that. But now it's extraordinarily easier to go to the conferences and there's no better way to understand what's important in, in your field and you get this external view. The final advice, do not trust your advisor, right? The advisor is only interested in his or her career, not yours. They may give you extra work to do, which you have time, which might interfere with your GPA and delay graduation, the alternative. Try trusting your advisor. The primary attraction of somebody with a PhD of going to a university versus going to a research lab is grad students. Uh, people in research labs can't wait for the grad students to show up in, in the summers because there's such a joy to work with. Uh, it's kind of, you know, for all the stuff you have to do as a professor, your reward is grad students. And you get judged by the success of your grad students. Right. If, if you know you think you've had a great career, somehow none of your graduate students have been successful. That reflects badly on you. So you, even if you're selfish, you want your grad students. Right? So if you're at a great university, the professors there are pretty successful people. They've been through this. Try listening to them. So my last piece of advice um, is I was giving this talk, and about that time that I was giving this talk, a uh, Ramsey Arpachi just so uh, graduated. And or it was, we had started his career. And I said, boy, you did really well. Why do you think he did so well? Now, Ramsey now is the chair of computer science at Wisconsin. So he's only a student from my perspective. So we had this conversation. Why did you do so well? He said, you gave me great advice when I arrived. And I said, like, really? What, what did I say? He said, he made three observations that's the good advice. Sink or swim. Success is determined by me, the student, primarily. Faculty are going to try and set up what they think is a great opportunity. Boy, I wish I had that opportunity when I was a student, but it's up to you to take advantage of it. Faculty are not tremendous managers. They're not gonna tell you every step of the way. They're gonna give, kind of set it up and let you sink or swim. Read, learn on your own. Uh, I, he said, I, th I think you told me, I gave him a stack of 20 papers to read. Don't expect the professor to know everything. And that's this last advice, teach your advisor. You go out and learn about something and teach the advisor. The faculty have many distractions going on. They're, you know, they've got a lot of good experience, but they're not aware of everything. Your job is to get them up to speed and help you what you want. And um, it, especially in computer science, it's this incredibly fast moving field. Uh, every year there's more and more new information and uh, the stuff that we learn in grad school isn't relevant anymore. So it's really hard to keep up. So your advisor is gonna be more successful if you can keep your advisor up to speed. And with that, uh, the, all the other advice was really great. Uh, I agree with everything that everybody else said. For me personally, my horseback riding uh, 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 release is I play soccer. I still play soccer. I'm in my 70s, I still play soccer. But I have never once, while playing soccer, had a thought about computer science. In 40 years of playing soccer, never has that happened. And you really need to kind of do uh, Take advantage of, have fun. You need to have fun as an adult to be able to have a successful life. And with that, I will uh, stop my two minutes here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, we have a question from the audience for the panel. The, um, the panel talked about the importance of speaking and public speaking and giving talks. And we're wondering if the panel has advice on how to do that in a focused way. How can students learn to give good talks uh, are there any good ways to practice that sort of thing? So one of the things is practice, practice, practice. So use your local research groups to kind of give progress reports every so often. Also, 
just practice kind of a giving these short elevator talks. We'll be able to explain what you're working on in one minute, in 30 seconds, in five minutes. Have different lengths ready. Because then you really need to focus on why are you doing the work that you're doing? What is the key idea? And those are the same kind of things that you will need to write down in the introduction and the conclusion of your papers. And a lot of papers are done with the introduction, with the motivation, getting that stuff right. The next thing that I like to do is whenever I'm listening to a talk, I ask myself, hey, why did I enjoy that talk? What did I like about it? What did I not like about it? Because by reflecting about other people giving talks, one can pick up a lot of stuff that one may want to do oneself. If, if I was going to chime in, I, I do have how to give a bad talk <laughs> version. So you can look you can look that up. That was that was my first bad thing. Um, I think what's nice about modern technology is that uh, if you're kind of shy about giving talks, you can give a practice talk at, using either Zoom or uh, Google Meet all by yourself and record yourself. And uh, I mean, it's kind of uh, humbling <laughs> to watch yourself talk and hear all the ums and ahs and stuff like that. But you can practice all by yourself until you feel better about it. But the best thing is giving talks in, in front of people uh, to do that. Now, what I would do uh, in my, I, I would teach a course on how to be a a successful teaching assistant. And one of the things that I did was to uh, take advantage of my wife who teaches acting improvisation. And in acting improvisation, you stand up in front of a group of people and you don't know what's going to happen and you try to entertain them. And the, um, the, the benefit of that is you learn to think on your feet. And so once you've tried acting improvisation, suddenly you're not terrified that something will go wrong because in, in improvisation, you know, a, a mistake is a gift and you try and do the best of it. So it's kind of surprisingly, you might try to do something, you know, kind of that stretches yourself to get you more comfortable in front of a, a group of people. But communication is never, you know, you can see what's happened in this quarantine, right? Oral communication is really important. I don't think that's gone away in your career. So it'd be a, a figure out a ways to practice and get better at it. Yeah, and I think it's tempting to think that you do the research first and then you write it up or prepare a talk. But the, the, the communication is really intrinsic in, in refining the idea in the first place. And as I find writing early, giving talks early, really important to help you crystallize what the actual problem you're working on is and whether the motivation and problem statement are solid. And in fact, it's often the case when you're writing a paper, you rip it up to shreds multiple times. So it's easy to get to be a perfectionist and get writer's block because you're trying to write it to be perfect. But often writing something just bad enough that uh, you know that you can essentially get feedback on it and then edit it later. It's it's a, it's a it's a gift to being able to write faster, because if you're really trying to make it perfect, it's going to take a long time and it's just going to get torn up once you go back and realize it's actually not the best way to to really crystallize the idea and organize the paper. So so writing early and not not getting too wrapped up wrapped up in it being perfect before uh, before iterating is really important. Uh, yeah, I think like it's to... also oh, okay. don't get. Don't get stuck on what you wrote because somebody else is likely to rewrite it. So if you're too much stuck to, oh, but I own that sentence, it should never be changed. This is probably not going to be working out. Uh, I'd like to say something here about the, the practice, practice and special for foreign students. When you uh, arrive in a foreign country, you have so much, many things to adapt and language is one problem. So. Uh, it really helps when you take, a, a, let's say, a, a course in another department to say how to write technical stuff and practice. I remember, just to joke a little bit, I remember uh, for my final exam in PhD, I wanted to practice, so I gave a lecture to my uh, two-month-old son, and you can imagine, <laughs> my wife, my wife slept, but my two old, <laughs> two-month-old son, he stared at me all the time, so that was really nice. But today, what I do with my students, I, I usually like people to cooperate. So I, I, I ask them all the time to give lectures to each other, to train. 
and that has been really helpful. Uh, I got people, young, young uh, students that didn't know how to talk and anything, and after that, they are now uh, uh, professors, and they are now at the university, and they give great lectures, so practice is very important. Yeah, if, if I add to that story, there was a, we do these research retreats, and part of the reason for the research retreats the twice a year is just to give students a chance to give talks. And one guy was so terrified, and all in, in 40 years of being a professor, he ran away. He, he, it was time for him to give a talk. He was gone. He had left the building. And but by the time he graduated, you know, uh, I don't know how comfortable he felt, but he was actually a very good speaker. You know, he could give a really great talk, but he was so terrified that he actually he, he ran away. That and uh, so practice can can turn things around. So thanks to all the panelists for the great advice so far. Um, I just have a couple general advice questions that I think would be helpful for um, grad students across different fields. So uh, we've just been talking about like speaking and writing. Are there any other important skills that you think are uh, really useful in grad school? In, in an area like computer networking, like you know, many of us on this call are in, I think it's an area where there's a rich domain of complicated problems to solve, but often the disciplinary technique one needs to use to solve them may come from another field, whether it's algorithms or cryptography or optimization or distributed systems. And so I find it really useful to master a problem domain and a disciplinary technique and to bring the two of them together. Otherwise, it can be very easy to do work that's, that's sort of relevant, but not rigorous in any particular way or vice versa, the rig a rig rigorous work that might not be well motivated. So I often try to figure out when a student starts working with me, is there some disciplinary technique that they want to hone to be able to wield effectively against a, a set of problems they want to study in their PhD work? The other thing is students were completely different. There is no one student that is equal to another student, just like there is no one advisor that is equal to yet another advisor. So you need to find a problem that suits you, that is of interest to you, where you can find an angle that, hey, this is what I want to learn. This is where I want to kind of attack it, where you have some kind of idea on how to do it. And then go with small steps and chop away at the problem to solve the final big one. It is unlikely that we will be able to solve the big problem in just the day. It will take time, so you need to be able to slice a problem. You need to be able to find a way to kind of a look at the simplified version of it, to simplify it, to abstract it, to find abstractions in how you can actually deal with the problem. And then to communicate them, explain them, get advice by other people, talk about it, and then find your way of solving it. Amanda, you're on mute. I'm sorry, my, my phone was <laughs> off, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, here's one, one thing that I'd like to emphasize, uh, the uh, cooperation between uh, the students. Uh, I had a, a wonderful experience in, when I was a graduate school and one, uh, I, I remember we had a visitor professor uh, once and uh, uh, he taught a wonderful class and then we asked him to teach a second class and said, no, you guys do the work. I'm not gonna teach anything. So that uh, uh, allows us to group, to, to found a group of students and we keep that uh, uh, group on for more than a year that we met every time uh, to go to a subject that helped to learn new material, that helped to go deeper in problems, learn the problems of, uh, uh, of other students. And till today, I try to uh, create a culture that all the new students come, they interact with each other, and they uh, do stuff together, uh, publish paper together, and the older, the older students, the more experienced, they help the younger students. And uh, uh, I think that uh, cooperation is a key thing that you can uh, go take for your life uh, all the way through from the graduate school to your life. So that's one advice that I'd like to emphasize. Uh, 
my phone is being muted uh, without yeah, can you, could you hear something or not yeah okay sorry so earlier um, in Dave's slides, he talked about going to conferences. Um, and I think this might be a skill that um, not all grad students have when they first uh, start their PhD. So do you have any advice on how to network effectively, especially like with more um, senior researchers in the community, if you're a newer PhD student, and also how to network um, both virtually during the pandemic and post pandemic, hopefully when things are more in person? So. I think one good thing when you're going to a conference is try to see if there is somebody that you already know and that can introduce you to other people. If you're going there without already knowing anybody, talking to your direct neighbor that you're sitting next to or kind of a, talking to a random person at a coffee machine is a very good way to get started. And don't hesitate. People are going to conferences because they want to chat, because also the hallway part is among the most important elements. Also, a lot of conferences do have mentoring sessions available where they help first timers or graduate students to kind of meet and greet and to interact with each other. Also, don't hesitate to talk to the more senior people. Of course, be respectful. Don't kind of say, hey, here I am, and I really want to talk to you about this problem, but they're in the middle of actually chatting with their friends and kind of <laughs> doing this. That typically is a way in which you can actually kind of uh, walk up to them, talk to them. Also, talking to people after the talks, in the chit chat after that, is a good way to get started. Yeah, I'll just add sometimes it's helpful to ask your advisor to introduce you to people ahead of time. I often do this when my students go to conferences. I'll email four or five people that I think are good for them to meet and actually arrange a time and a place for that person to meet that student just to make it easier. Because so, especially at large conferences, it can be hard to find people and people are always busy. And I'll sometimes suggest, you know, to another colleague, hey, can't, maybe your students and my students can get together for some sort of function during, during the week so that they end up being a posse. Uh, together, because the worst thing is you end up hanging out with only the people in your own research group and you do all the same things you could have done uh, back in back in your own department. And that's obviously a wasted opportunity. Uh, the other thing I try to do, I'm a, I'm a, I tend to be pretty shy myself, and especially when I was a grad student, I was, is that you find someone else who looks even more shy than you and, and you sort of take on a responsibility to, to make them feel more comfortable. I, I sometimes feel guilt is a very powerful motivator that if I feel uh, someone else can be made more more comfortable by my going and talking to them, then I'll feel less, less shy about uh, talking to someone I don't know. Uh, I, I, this, this is all great advice. Uh, so uh, a thing I would do, I, I think getting it, um, people, uh, you know, researchers like to be asked questions about their work. You know, they, they like that, right? Because, oh, somebody cares. Uh, I think in a modern conferences, you can usually read the papers before you get there. So if it, there was some papers in an area that you were interested in, you read the papers and you and you contacted in advance. I had some questions about these things. I'm gonna try and track you down at the conference and talk to you about it. You know, people like that. Um, and now the natural tendency, and I'm sure I did the same thing when I was a grad student, is to find other people from your institution and hang out with them the whole time. That is what's probably going to happen. You have to not do that. I, when I see my students doing that, I scold them. You can't, we, I flew you all the way here. You are all sitting, you see each other every day. Why are you sitting together not talking to people? You people, you know, maybe computer pe people are kind of nerdy and that's what we do. But, it may, and maybe, you know, in psychology, everybody talks to each other, but in our group, we tend to stay by ourselves and talk to our friends. So don't do that, don't miss the opportunity. What you're doing in grad school is trying to find a problem that you can tackle and write a book about, right? That's kind of, it's not, that's not a small thing and you need to pick that. So it's a tremendous opportunity to hear ideas outside of your field, see what other people think is important that maybe your advisor doesn't understand. And, uh, and people uh, are flattered when you ask them good questions. So uh, uh, make sure you do that. I believe what they're trying to do with all the virtual conferences is trying to, f all the older people who've participated in hallway conversations want the virtual conferences to have that because you know it's tremendously better for the planet it saves money but 
we missed the hallway conversation. So they're trying to figure out a way to do that. And if, if we can pull that off, it'll be fantastic because then we can, more people can participate. It'll save the planet. It'll save money and we'll still get the benefits. But right now, I think people, we were forced to do the quarantine. We're probably going to have some hybrid thing going over. And the reason people are reluctant is exactly for people having these conversations at the event. And so don't miss out on that. And indeed, don't yeah, skip that's... socials. The socials <laughs> that, are that's... among the most important parts and the way where you learn to meet people. Yeah, that's that's an important thing. Yeah. A really... If you want to uh, mute again, and then... Uh... Somebody muted him. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, but that, uh, an important way to... Uh, uh, let's say break the ice is exactly read the paper that you are interested in your areas and go to the person uh, to the talk. Uh, if you do that before, it will break the ice. And as David said, if uh, everyone likes to talk about your work, so it's a way to interact with people. And uh, <clears throat> so, and it's important. I will extend the advice of mix with other people, even if you go to a, when you go to a school that you don't know anyone especially as a, you are a foreign student you tend to keep with your own community and, and that's not good uh, uh, talk to other people uh, one of the nice things of the university you have a variety of people all over the world so interact with people uh, learn the other culture uh, don't stick with your own uh, group of people that you know before. That's a wonderful experience to learn other people and can extend not only to conference, which are very important, but to your home place, I mean, to your university place as well. So, dear panelists, dear panelists uh, graduate students have to, to do a lot of reading, they have to do a lot of research, and they have to, to find a lot of paper, uh, academic papers uh, to uh, gather information to do a lot of work uh, like that. How can they now, uh, which uh, are, papers are fine to go to go with, which papers are fine to read instead of uh, not wasting time uh, to read uh, some useless papers? I'll, I'll jump in there. I think, first of all, it's tempting to not view the reading of papers as part of the work itself. So you sort of feel unproductive when you're reading because you're not producing anything. And I think for, the first thing is to, to try to, to not feel that way to the extent you can, that really digesting the ideas of others is an important part of doing good work. That said, I mean, it's important to read the paper actively with an eye towards why you're reading it and, for, and, and to, you know, to what end. Because it can be very easy to read a lot of papers at sort of an intermediate level of attention and not get very much out of it. And so I think there's a lot of good advice on how to read a paper at different levels of detail, depending on what you're reading it for, trying to understand if it's important for you to read it deeper and only reading more deeply when it is. So I think being purposeful and, and having a, a reason for reading the paper or something you're trying to get out of it, skipping the sections that aren't yet material uh, to, to your reading so that it's really something you're reading for, for an active purpose, very different than studying for an exam. Now, of course, with Google Scholar, it gives you some indications in terms of what papers may be well respected because they are highly cited, but it's not always a paper that is the most cited one that is the most relevant one. Take a look at who are the co-authors and at some point you will probably kind of see from the writing, the way that the problem is phrased, whether it kind of fits the kind of mode that you're looking for, but this takes time. This is a skill to be learned and reading groups can help that, reading seminars can help that, just reading the papers of your fellow students in your research group, finding out who are the stars in your community, read their papers and then move on from there. If, if I were to add to that, I think uh, 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 Anna mentioned reading groups. That's a nice way to do it. Typically, what that means is a group of grad students will get together. One person, you're all supposed to read it, but one person will take the responsibility of presenting it. So that can be, and then you can have this conversation what's important. I think it's, I think you need to know the classics of the field. I think those of us who've been in the field for a long time, just shake our heads when somebody reinvents something that 
there's, there's already been a bunch of papers on this topic. Uh, there's an unfortunate, maybe it's human nature, but just jump in and do, you know, I think the phrase was, uh, why waste an afternoon in the library when I can spend six weeks inventing it myself, right? It's, uh, it's know the classics of the field. And uh, I, you know, without naming names, at Berkeley, you have to take courses as a grad student. At some universities, they say, oh, you don't have to take courses anymore. And some of those universities, the grad students don't know the literature. They don't know the classic pieces of the field and, and they don't benefit from that work. And they and then they'll write their paper and they'll get reviews like, how could you do this and not cite these fundamental papers? Uh, the fundamental papers your advisor should be able to tell you about. I think another, in, in, you know, in, in my uh, current senior status, <laughs> I think you ought to look at stars of the field and see the papers they're working on. They're going to, they have, they're not necessarily, they're trying to change the world, right? They're not trying to get, you know, the most papers published per year. Like if they're a star, they're trying to do serious work. They're not trying to, you know, uh, get more papers than everybody else. The ink, the, the least publishable unit, uh, like in, Jennifer in networking, I would go look at her papers and see what she's working on these days. But know the classics. Scholar can help. If it's older, probably. If it's a classic, it probably has citations. But uh, um, David, can you please kind of define the least publishable units? It may not be a term that is okay. known to everybody. Oh, yeah. OK. It's even abbreviated APU. So in my bad career talk, <laughs> I say the most important thing is the number of papers you publish. And so what you want, you don't want to have too many good ideas in one paper. Because if you just divided it up into papers that just barely got accepted by a conference, you could have like 10 papers instead of one. And the winner has the most papers. So least publishable unit is this uh, snide comment upon a person who just publishes the same thing over and over again with very trivial changes. And as far as we can tell, it's just so they have a paper in every single conference in their field. But, you know, it's it's uh, to figure out what the hell they're working on. You have to read like a dozen versions of the paper. Right. And that's not you know, it's actually that's not how the world works. You don't win awards for the most papers. Uh, it's actually having impact. And so what you want is to follow people who are trying to have impact, who are trying to make big differences and people like people like Jennifer in networking or as an example of that. So this is, it's a little hard to figure that out uh, because somebody could have a tremendous number of citations because they just have a huge number of incremental papers. But, but what matters is, you, you know, over a career, you don't have that many great ideas, right? You have a few great ideas and you, you, need, you wanna try and acquire that taste. Uh, I, and the reading groups, reading groups can help, right? Especially if there's a little bit more senior students and junior students, you can kind of, Help figure that out. It's less work. It's a little bit more fun. You know, it's more social. It, you know, you've got that pressure to read the paper because, oh my God, it's tomorrow. But uh, this is one of the skills you do have to have is to be able to read new papers, figure out what's significant and what's not significant. How does it relate to the literature that already exists? That, that's probably, you know, that's a lower bar of what you have to do in grad school. Because you come out of grad school, you got all kinds of skills and you don't know the field, you know, you're going to get, uh, you know, you run into a guy like me, people are going to make, almost make fun of you. You don't know about, you don't know about multics? <laughs> what? <laughs> how, how, how did they let you get a PhD? You don't know what multics is, right? So. Yeah, I'd like to stress uh, 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 this uh, uh, social part in terms of reading groups. It's very nice to learn with other people and it's good, but it's not a waste of time to learn or to read a lot of papers. Sometimes you are alone and you have to read and then you find out that although you go through a huge number of papers, you, you create this sense of what is good and what is, is bad. And that's important for your career as well. So it may sound like a very wa a waste of time in the beginning, but as you go along, as you move in the ladder, you, you, you learn uh, to filter those uh, uh, good piece of work. So it's not a total waste of time, but you can shorten the, the path to learn how to do it with reading groups a lot. If not, 
waste time. It's not a way, I, I mean, lose time is not a waste of time all along. I think in general, when you're starting out looking at a project, you're probably looking at a whole wide space, looking at the problem at different angles, etc. Then at some point, you probably want to decide, hey, I need to kind of make progress on something more specific. Then you need to pick out something much more concrete. Then you need to think about, oh, there are different ways, broad ways of solving the problem. Then at some point it will come down to, oh, there's a paper deadline coming up. I need to focus. I need to actually go ahead and go from the breadth first into a depth first kind of mode to really pick out and solve the problem and write it up in a specific way. And sometimes, at least for me, having a deadline makes me focus. And focus means that instead of reading 20 or 40 papers, I only skip those papers and figure out the ones that I actually need to look at and then move forward. And that typically uh, quickens the progress. Yet I couldn't do that if I hadn't spent some time looking breadth first and then doing the depths first. So uh, here is a question um, regarding we are discussing about the research papers. So mostly graduate students want to know uh, how to balance between collaboration and doing your own work. And besides this, there are some other questions from the participant that how to manage your research work all, uh, along with PhDs and other academic stuff. So on the on the I didn't hear the tail end of the question, but on the on the subject of working in groups versus working individually, I think it's very personal to the student actually which style of work is a better fit for them. I'll often encourage students in their first research project to either tackle a somewhat more scaled down problem so they can take it from soup to nuts from beginning to end within a within a year to get sort of to see all the steps of conducting research, or to get involved in a somewhat bigger project where they're one of several people involved. And either one is a good way to see the process of research from beginning to end in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And I see which, which one the student does. It depends partially on personal taste on whether they prefer to work alone or in a group, or also is there an ongoing project when they arrive that might actually be a match for their interest? And if so, they might get involved in that. And if not, circumstances might just be that it's not a, not a good option. So I think both modes of work are, are really interesting. And I think one way for it to be productive is either there's a more senior student or postdoc involved, in which case there's sort of a mentor mentee relationship within the project, or the others in the project bring complementary skills, in which case you're, you're bringing something unique to the table because the others in the project have a, a different role in the project or a different disciplinary technique they're bringing to bear on a, on a problem that might be quite multifaceted such that it needs that, that breadth of expertise. And indeed, it's often a good thing to find your complementary skill that the other students may not have in order to kind of make progress on the overall project, because that will also show where your skill is indeed needed for the project. And so that you can compare yourself favorable with all the others. And you don't have to be the best on all the different avenues. I think nobody of us is the best in any in all of the things. Figure out what you're good at and use that to your advantage. Uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's a quite elaborative uh, answer, but one thing is mostly grad students are involved in academic activities as well. For example, they are uh, on the family for scholarship, so they are uh, like they have to face uh, in the terms of uh, their teaching assistantship or fellowship. So mostly they are doing a lot of time in consuming other than their academic research. So at the end, they find no way to balance between these two. So what do you suggest about to how to create a balance between their own research with the collaborative research? So these, these are the three things. First thing, their own research. For example, like a PhD student, it has to take his dissertation as a first primarily. Second thing is, is a joint collaborative work during going on in the lab or some other professor's collaboration. Third thing is a TSA or some sort of a visit lectures or sessions as a faculty plus PhD student. So how to create a balance between these three things? 
time. Gonna talk Dave. And I, I, okay. I, I, I still think well, collaboration it helps a lot. Although it's, I understand that it's sometimes difficult uh, to separate, then go to your own path and do your own piece of work. But uh, I, I prefer at least uh, for my students that they learn from each other and they do collaborate. At some point, it comes it comes naturally to the student uh, the, to find uh, his or her own path and do your own work. But uh, it, I, I see people growing in the uh, uh, in the understanding of the problem in like Anjan said uh, uh, complementary skills uh, they grow their own work collaborate with other people and uh, if you do that and if you, you try to participate in this environment and, and again it doesn't need to be your advisor to create this collaboration group it, it's nice if you have that but even the students with uh, 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 around the, the group maybe that uh, are from a class you can create that environment all along and perhaps ask the advice the, the help of a, a faculty member uh, who likes this interaction but i i think the benef benefits for cooperation they are much more than try to go the, the own path in the beginning. Uh, then you go uh, along. It's not that difficult to find your own research. That's my advice. Yeah, I, if I would add to that, I think the thing to keep in mind, you know, it's it's going to take several years to get a PhD. Uh, I was the first. No one in my family going to graduate school when they told me how long to take a PhD. I thought it was like a medical degree. I thought I got it after four years. It takes longer than that. <laughs> Uh, and so it changes over time. In the beginning, I would strongly encourage people, and, and, and unless you really have a problem working with groups, is to work in groups. Eventually, you're going to have to do something all by yourself. Your PhD is not a, is not a team project. A lot of computer science, after you get your PhD in outside of academia, is done in teams. So it's a skill that would be very valuable to pick up. I think the advantage if in the first couple of years you're doing more team stuff is you're learning a lot of stuff and working with more senior students is a great way and people in other fields is a great way to learn things. So I didn't, if you can, try to work with groups in the beginning. Eventually, um, you know, you, when you get further down the road, you're going to be more focused doing le less team stuff, but thinking of it changing over time. In terms of courses versus research, like I said, it's not the grades. You know, you need to learn the basics. But if you're excited about a research project, there's something's going on. That's that's higher priority. And you know, eventually, you know, the faculty will help sort out who gets credit for what. And eventually, you're going to do something where you're all by yourself. But I, I, don't worry about that too much the first couple of years. Try to be working on something that's good stuff, no matter how many people you work with. And later in your career, you can worry about, you know, getting more, you know, the most, more of the share of the, of the credit. But in the beginning, you, there's so much to learn that it's just uh, gonna be easier if you work with others to learn those skills. Now, in some countries, there may be a balance between that your PhD is being paid for by a specific project where a certain task has to be done which may be slightly different from your research project. Now, the best thing to get going there is to find a way in which you can make your project work and your research work benefit from each other so that it is on a related problem, that it's the same kind of thing so that you can use both things and take it full advantage of both of them. Indeed, if your research project is on something completely different then what is paying for your PhD time? That may not be the best advice. And you may want to think about finding a different project to work on a different advisor or a different research group.
Um, thank you, professors. And uh, I, I'm Lim from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and I'm a, fir a first year PhD student. And I'd like to ask a question, which is also a concern of many of our audience. So this is that um, I really admire those people like you that can be really highly motivated to uh, do research into the questions and to talk about the research projects. But I think that um, as some PhD students, we really um, come across many difficult times when during our research. And this may make us very disappointed or uh, feeling frustrated of ourselves and think that, am I really suitable to do a PhD or something like that? So um, would, you, would you mind uh, giving us some suggestions on how to keep yourself highly motivated during the process and also how to deal with the stress of not making progress? Thank you. Yeah. That's a fabulous question. I think one thing that's great about grad school is it's highly efficient. You're learning at your own pace. And what's great about that is you can skip the easy stuff and focus your time on the hard parts and you end up learning by direct one-on-one -on -one feedback. So the good thing about that is it's highly efficient. The bad thing about that is it's actually quite hard on the ego because you don't get to spend time doing the stuff you're remarkably good at. And, and the one-on-one -on -one feedback, particularly when it's critical, can be quite difficult on the, on the self-esteem. And so I think there, there is an act of, of being in love with your work and yet being able to take criticism of it. That takes a lot of time. I don't think any of us have actually mastered that, including I think the panelists. But I think, I think a couple of things that I find helpful, I mean, one is having a portfolio of things going on in one's life. You know, the horseback riding and the soccer that Anya and David uh, mentioned, I think are good examples. Something else in your life beyond your work so that when there's a setback at work, it's not, your, it's not a setback in your entire life. It's, it's a bump in the road and it's, there are other things going on that compensate. Uh, that's one. And I think being involved in team projects, like so, several of the other panelists mentioned, there, there's a, a, an esprit de corps, a camaraderie, uh, working with one's peers, even, even a shared um, experience around frustration with papers not getting in or ideas not moving along and being able to share that experience with, with friends and colleagues that are experiencing it with you. I think it, uh, I know there's misery loves company, but there's, there's truth in it when you're around people you can you can share frustrations with and blow off steam. I, I would uh, I, I, a couple of things I want to say. There's there's something called the imposter syndrome that's real. Uh, I remember the imposter syndrome is they made a mistake letting you in, and you know I I I'm I'm in the group. Uh, I'm a white male. I can't possibly, yeah, even, even white males, the, dom, the dom, domineering gender and race, the same thing happens. When I got to Berkeley, I just thought any day they say, oh no, Patterson, no, no, we, we offered Peterson, not Patterson, that, you, you're the wrong guy. And so you got you got it, that's gonna happen in grad school. That's gonna, it's just a thing, it's human. You know, if you have an exceptionally strong ego, maybe you won't have the imposter syndrome, but that's just gonna happen. Uh, in terms of, uh, Advice, the best advice I got. So one of my advisors at UCLA, you know, a few years ago, actually worked with John von Neumann, the von Neumann. And, and he told me every grad student that he knew, going back to John von Neumann, at least once thought their dissertation was completely worthless. It, it's going to have, you're working on a topic, you work on it for a year or more, and you're going to decide, Nobody cares. This is a waste of time, right? That is going to happen. <laughs> and so what are you going to do to, to compensate for that? Well, like they said, one of the benefits of team projects is there's other people that you can commiserate with. It's less lonely. The downside of doing something all by yourself is it's, it's fewer people uh, to, sh to share with. It can also help if you participate in conferences and they have things, they have what are called poster sessions where you can, uh, say I'm doing a work in this area and let me talk to you about it and people go up and talk to you. What I found is with grad students, when you have this opportunity to talk about your work and outsiders come up, outsiders will think your work is really interesting. You'll like, I'm tired of talking about this. I haven't had any progress in a long time. And strangers will come up and say, wow, this is really interesting. Well, have you thought about that? And so if you can figure out some way to get some external um, reaction to what you're doing, it's gonna be, uh, less discouraging, but you absolutely will get discouraged um, no matter what as part of 
pottery tradition. That has to happen. Uh, I've never seen it not happen, including to all of us. Indeed. I think all of us have gotten papers rejected, gotten the criticism like, what the heck are you doing here? This is kind of well, well known stuff. Like at at t there was always somebody that we were new that might be standing up and saying, oh, this work has been done in the 80s. Why don't you know about it? Be ready for that. Be ready to accept it. And you're never ready, but still it will happen. It's part of the PhD experience, I'm afraid. And I think it has happened to all of us. And we have to live with it. Don't take criticism as personal criticism. It is criticism of the work. It should be always done in a constructive manner. Sometimes people forget about that, unfortunately. But the criticism is of the work, not of the person, I mean. But nevertheless, it can be hurtful and it can be leading to depression. A lot of people in the community suffer from that. If you notice that this is coming up, go get help. There is medical help. There are advisors. There is no drawback to searching for help. Go out and go and look for help. And indeed, the fact that you're looking for help is the first step to actually improve. And it's a huge step forward. Don't hesitate to do so. Let me say some personal story. When I was at UCLA at some point of my dissertation, I felt a big pain in my chest. And I said, oh my God, what's happened? So I went to the hospital and uh, saw the doctor examine and everything and say, what do you do? And I told her I was a PhD student. And he said, he said are you in a critical part of your dissertation? How are you going? I said, yes. I said, Oh, <laughs> happens to everyone. Go back home and <laughs> continue to study. And I kept thinking, yes, it happens to everyone. So like everyone here said, that I see it happens to my students. And I, when a new guy come and start working the dissertations, look, you're going to feel miserable at some point. Don't let that. When you do that, come talk to me. Don't let that strip be a big problem to you. It happens to everyone. And I uh, try to encourage good criticism for uh, the students. Uh, they are friends, make friendships, to criticize the other work, but in a good way. So they, they learn to take that, as Angela said, not as a personal thing, as a thing that they, uh, the criticism is good for you to improve your, your, uh, your studies to improve your career but anyway the doctor what the doctor said to me at that time it stayed in my mind till today it said oh i'm part of the crowd i'm not gonna die <laughs> so uh it, it really helped me and it goes in ups and downs all the time until the end that's why i said in the beginning you have to enjoy what you're doing if you like that look like a puzzle uh, if you like to do a puzzle you may not get to the solution but you are great you are getting uh, enjoyment uh, uh, to uh, try to get to this solution and that's very helpful and you see look I'm, I'm learning and that's a good thing I am working with other people I'm meeting people all over the world that's very good that's uh, parts of the enjoyment so don't feel that you are a bad person or have some problem. Everyone has that. Okay, everyone, um, this is this is going really well. There's a lot of questions and um, there's not enough time to answer them all and we're coming up on the hour. So we're gonna do two things right now. Um, first, we usually end on the hour, but if it's all right with everybody, we're gonna keep going a little bit more and run over time. Um, some of the panelists are able to say, um, not everyone's able to say, and that's okay. Uh, but we're going to try and keep talking a little bit more. Um, and if anyone on the Zoom has to leave, that's totally fine. But we're going to keep going uh, a little bit more and continue to answer questions. Um, second, when the the Zoom ends, uh, we you know we we encourage you to join the Slack. You can keep asking questions there. We'll try and keep answering them. Um, and also, if you've been through grad school before and you have answers to some of these questions, we encourage you to join the Slack and help us answer the questions there as well. Uh, so feel free to join and answer uh, questions there as well. But um, 
yeah, Lynn, maybe you can keep going with your questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, professors. And your suggestions are really meaningful to me. And as I take that, I think um, what you are suggesting is that we should admit that this may happen to almost everyone. And we must keep the, the chances for us to learn from them and also keep a little bit of detachment from that. Don't be totally observed into it. So then I have another follow-up question that may be a little bit personal. So do you have some like fixed time schedules for work-life balance? For example, will you spare some, uh, for example, an afternoon for movie watching or something like that to make you a little bit detached from the research or things like that to uh, just to keep a work-life balance? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Uh, you can't do research 14 hours a day. Don't, don't fool yourself. It's, this is not, this, I don't think you can do product development 14 hours a day, but you certainly can't do research 14 hours a day. It's not a straight path uh, to there. You need to have an alert mind. Uh, so for me personally, um, what I, the advice I give is to figure out your most productive time of the day. Uh, when I was a grad student, I think it was evening. Uh, after I had kids, it, I switched and I, I get up early now. If you, if you work with me, I'll get up at five o'clock in the morning. And if I can get two solid hours in without distractions where my mind's at its best, uh, I'm not answering email or disruptions, you know, that's a pretty good day. Uh, so I remember at, as a grad student at UC, also at UCLA, what I did for a while was I would get, I would come in early, get all my research done by noon so I could go play volleyball in the afternoon in, you know, in Southern California in the sunshine. And I was really productive because I didn't fool around in the morning. I got to jump in and get my work done so I could go play volleyball. So you need to take it, it, you, you're, you're trying to come up with ideas. Some of it is grinding, but some, a lot of it is good ideas. And even when you're grinding, you might come up with a better idea how to get it done faster. So it's, uh, you got to keep your mind active, not just see if you can put in an 80 hour work week. You know, occasionally, maybe for a paper deadline or something, you got to work. Uh, there's no life balance, but you, it, that's not sustainable. You, you will not, uh, not be happy. <laughs> now, I think all of us who've gotten our PhDs have a fond memory of graduate school. That was one of our best times of our lives. You know, you didn't have a lot of responsibilities. You got to get out of the work you want. I think of what I'm doing now in my second career is kind of being a grad student again. So try to enjoy it. And if you're not enjoying it, then you're not doing it right. Because if, if you're unhappy, you're not going to be an effective grad student. And so uh, and there's this thing that happens when you're a kid, you don't have to tell a kid to play. You don't have to remind a kid to go out and play. You, they do that. When you're an adult, you need to make sure you find time to play. It's an important part of the healthy, happy lives. And to be effective, you, you need to have fun. So figure out what that is. And you absolutely have time for that. Very effective, very successful grad students have an outside life and they do something else uh, to, 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 to keep them happy. Figure, whether that's being in plays or playing music, or for me it's sports, but find that thing that gives you joy and that it's gonna help complement what you do. And you know, maybe you'll give it up for a week or for a paper deadline, but don't decide that you're gonna stop having fun because you have to do that to be able to get your work done. Yeah, I completely agree with David. I'll just add two, two things. I think one, if doing the right work at the right time of day, it's something David alluded to, is really important. And I, I violate that rule all the time. Last night at midnight, I fell asleep reading a paper with a lot of math in it. I don't know why I did that, but I always do that and I always fall asleep. I don't know why. And I'll restart that paper 10 times because I make that mistake 10 well, times. Well, if, if you have a sleep problem, it's perfect, right? Yeah, what do I, 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 oh, okay, I'll start reading the math paper. <laughs> It works. It works. So yeah, figuring out the time of day to do each kind of work. I mean, because it could be different kinds of work. You're maybe you can babysit email at that time of night, but reading math is a bad idea. I've learned again last night. Um, the second that related also to what David said, I think it's really easy, especially if you're in a, in a work environment where you have a shared office where people socialize during the day. And then you end up at the end of the day feeling like you haven't gotten enough done. So you continue to work longer. And because you're working longer, you sort of feel entitled to socialize more because you're already working a lot of hours. And so it can be very easy to have a long day at work and not get much done and not get much playing done. 
And so I think it, to the carving out the time, not only the time, but figure out the right place to do the kind of work David talked about. And in some cases, maybe it isn't in your office, actually, because it might be too distracting there. But to make sure that you do carve out concentrated time to work, time to connect with colleagues, and time to not be with anything related to work, rather than have it all be mushed together, because it's sort of, you get you get um, a lot of time spent at work without any of those things being achieved, if, if it's too diffuse. And, and whatever you do, don't, don't read email during your most productive time of day, or you guys don't read email. So don't check your phone during the most productive times of day that you want to, when you're all, when you're falling asleep at night, that's when you should check your email or, or answer your texts. But if you want to get work done, you, you, you have to concentrate. And uh, we, we, we are responsible for extraordinarily distracting technology. We have made the whole world less productive because of our technology. So, we have to avoid using our technology if we're going to get any work done. Well, it's less productive in some sense, but also more productive because it enables collaboration. So you need to know how to focus. And I think one of the things that really helps is if you want to do something else, you're probably much more concentrated and productive getting the other stuff done and out of the way that you need to do in order to actually get to the stuff that you want to do. So. It, if I know that I want to leave at seven because I want to go horseback riding, well, I will find out the way in which I can manage to get all the most important things done by the time in order to be able to go. Now, I think as a grad student, I really kind of all enjoyed it that I could spend one or two weeks completely emerged in terms of focusing on the reset problem, getting a paper done, and then taking a week off when I wasn't at school, when I actually did something else to kind of keep up for the time that I didn't have during the time that I focused on the paper deadline. And being able to have this intensive time and then some relaxed time, I think for me was one of the important parts. Yes, what, what uh, has been said here about finding uh, a time that you concentrate and then you don't look at the email, don't look at uh, whatever message system you have. It's, it's very important. And um, uh, it's very important to find something like soccer. In my graduate school, I found myself doing windsurf, which I never had done before. And because UCLA provided that, it was, it was excellent. I feel much more productive if I done my, my class of windsurf. And look at the pandemic, the pandemic case right now. I'm stuck at home for a long period of time. It's awful. My productivity went down. <laughs> Although I'm sitting more time in the in the chair in the computer, but went down. Uh, being uh, from Brazil, I like to be to go out to be to be at the sun and things like that. So uh, uh, it really helps you if you find time for things that you like to do and uh, take your energy uh, like some like soccer or whatever thing that you like uh, maybe don't get uh, stay uh, in front of a television then something uh, some activity some uh, things that uh, ask you to, to be active uh, to release the pressure for the phd but uh, take those two three hours, whatever you need to uh, do your work, to concentrate and only work on that, except in the deadlines. Uh, by the way, I hate deadlines still today, but that's part of the life. You learn how, how to deal with it. Hello, professors. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm Sakhana Shingir from Saudi Arabia. And my next question is about diversity. As you said, communication and socializing is very important for a graduate student. So my question is about the relationship with supervisors or fellow researchers. How to, de to deal with conflict or disagreement with them, with the, adv with the advisor and the fellow researchers? Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll give it a shot. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I think I need more background what a conflict was. Uh, uh, I guess um, the way I did my research projects was 
we'd have this vigorous exchange of ideas is that there would be, I, I thought of it as a marketplace of ideas. And the more we debated the ideas, the better the ideas got. And, but key was uh, if everybody just listened to me and didn't debate my ideas, then it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, I, I remember Amin Vadat, who's a networking superstar, uh, when he was a young grad student said, well, Dave really feels strongly about this. So I don't know if I should speak up. And fortunately his advisor says, don't, <laughs> that's the wrong thing. You have to speak up. So uh, we certainly want vigorous exchanges, ideas and, and here, but it's about like, like I think Anya said, it's about the ideas, not about you and say, well, I think there's these weaknesses in the argument. So is that, that's not in my mind, that's not conflict, but that is a, uh, exchange of differing points of view. And so, you know, I would, if I was a grad student, I'd certainly want to be in an environment where you could have frank and vigorous exchanges on the pros and cons of ideas. If the situation you're in is you're, you know, you're not allowed to do that, then, you know, I try and find a different situation uh, because I don't, I don't understand how research works if you can't have disagreements and resolve them. Actually, one of the things that I tell my graduate students that is a minimal requirement in order to graduate is that they win a technical argument against me. <laughs> <laughs> because if they can't do that, if they can't stand up for their argument, there is a problem because how would they want to do that as an advisor later on, how would they do that in industry? They need to be able to stand up to their ideas and defend them. So that is definitely one of the minimal requirements that I require from everybody. And that is debate, argue, hone your argumentation strengths. And I still remember fondly all those arguments that Jen and I had when we were working together. <laughs> we stayed friends somehow through it. <laughs> I, agree, I agree with what, what David and Anya said. I think also it's worth noting, I mean, different advisors have very different cultures and re different research groups have very different culture. And to the extent you can figure that out before you pick your advisor, the better, whether that's talking to students of that advisor or coming to a visit day if the school offers a, a visit day for prospective students. The cultural differences are significant and you really want to have a good rapport with your advisor. It's really, really important to the extent you can. And then you, know, you may like their research. They may even be good people, but if you just don't have a personal rapport with them, it's going to be much more difficult to, to grow as a student. And so I just encourage you to look for ways to, to see if you have the, the similar, a similar taste or rapport with, uh, with your advisor. And second, there might be topics an advisor doesn't think to talk about at a group meeting that's on your mind. And it can be worthwhile to say, hey, you know, at the next group meeting, could we talk about racism in the field or bias or, you know, pick a topic or sexual harassment or anything like that that might be sensitive. It's probably something your advisor is thinking about and is either just being lazy to not talk about it at a group meeting or even feeling self-conscious about talking about. But it's a, it's a great opportunity to ask that those topics be discussed at group meetings or, or at department level functions as well to get more perspectives on the matter. Those things might not be happening, but they probably should be. And if they're not, you can help instigate them to, to make them happen. You're probably not the only person that's thinking about them. No, of course yeah, it can happen that you're working with a fellow student and it doesn't work out. Go I, talk I to your advisor about these things. They may be able to kind of move you on separate projects or, and if you notice that it isn't working out, try to find a solution as early as possible so that you're not losing too much time on this. But don't give up too early because you, by working through the situation, you may learn something and you may learn better communication skills as well. If it doesn't work out with your advisor, most places give you a chance in which you can actually work with the different people or switch advisors. Take advantage of that. Or if it doesn't work out with your direct advisor, try to see if there is a more senior postdoc that can act in between. That may also be a way in which you can actually get additional advice. Or a lot of people also encourage collaboration across research groups, even with research groups at different places in the world. 
So there is a lot of collaborative work. There's also the way to go out for an internship to get additional advice. Don't always believe all the things that your advisor is telling you. There might be a second, a third, and a fourth truth that is quite different from what your advisor was telling you. I, I, do like, I, I agree with everyone, uh, uh, everything that has been said, I totally agree. And I'd like just to add that when you, if you, uh, for foreign students, when you go to a different culture, sometimes you do not understand uh, that some things that your advisor or other person in the department, that's part of their culture because you, uh, uh, you will try to look to the other like a mirror of your own culture. So it helps if you try to understand some behavior that you may not be uh, alike, like part of the other culture, and that you are open to try to understand why uh, it happens the way it is happening. I don't know, I, I'm not saying that is your case, uh, 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 everything, I agree with everyone else, what you said, but sometimes when you go and you don't understand it, you think something personal, it may not be, it's just part of a different culture. And the more you learn about a different culture, it's also good for you. And you are more, let's say, forgiving, uh, says, oh, the other is thinking different, it's okay, it's great, I'm learning. Uh, uh, once you understand that, you'll be, uh, I think it helps us to be a better person. And, uh, and that, uh, as I said, that may not be your case, but uh, I, I've seen that happens uh, uh, a lot, that people try uh, to project what they expect for the other, for their own culture. No, try to understand the other. It's always very nice. Thank you, professors. Uh, one final question from my side. So how to balance the width and depth in the research scope? So how to stay on top of different knowledge area and at the same time be an expert in your field? Okay. Was it how do you keep kind of uh, what's going on in general versus your area? I, I think one of the great things about universities is there's lots of talks at universities. So again, you can't do research 14 hours a day. Uh, I would try and uh, attend some other talks. You know, it's, it's instead of watching television, <laughs> you know, you can go to some talks in some other fields or people think exciting. And of course, you know, with YouTube and all the video uh, talks, uh, it, it, it's a pretty easy today to be aware of what's going on in the field, that there's so much stuff going on. But you know, going to, you know, there's a lot you can get out of going and talk, including, you know, is this person a good speaker? Is this working? What are, what are they doing? What do I learn from the talk? So um, I, I would work that into your schedule. Great. Um, hi, I'm Amanda. I'm from University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, along with Professor Caesar. Um, and I wanted to ask some questions um, about maybe before you actually enter grad school and the application process. Um, so what um, are the most important factors when choosing the PhD supervisor and advisor and um, the research area that you want to focus on? And are there some key differences um, between what you might have focused on in undergraduate research um, with your undergraduate research advisor and when you enter graduate school? I think one thing to do is to look at the papers that the faculty member has written and see if they excite you. And not, not, not necessarily the specific research question, but maybe the research style or a research taste. And also to look at what, what, what happened when their students graduated, where did they go? What kind, of, what kind of work did they do individually? To get a sense, I know, does this advisor tend to do group projects? Do their students primarily go to industry or to academia after they graduate? And you, the answer is no right or wrong answer to any of those things, but, it, but having an advisor whose style of work matches your own personal ambitions and taste uh, can be really important. And so that can be at least a way to assess that. And even though it might not be easy to talk with the, the faculty member ahead of time, um, you can often talk to their students 
And then uh, they, you'll find out the truth from the students, right? The students know what's going on and they'll be much more candid about it. So I highly recommend to the extent you can meeting the faculty members, uh, research advisees to get the real scoop. I'd like to add uh, uh, to that, that it's also okay to, to change your mind as you go along with the stu study. I, I went to take a computer architecture when I went to my PhD because I, I liked that. During the course, I said, hmm, there are the areas that are nice. This kind of computer network is, is interesting. So I took courses and I tried to change. When I started my dissertation, I didn't have a topic, but I went to my, the, the person I had to chose as my advisor uh, uh, and say, look, I'd like to do more practical thing and said, yes, okay, fine. And in the middle, I did a lot of theory in, in, the, in the background and that was okay because I was enjoying it. And so I, I changed to different people and I learned uh, I, I work with different people in the department, and fortunately, uh, 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 the department allowed me to do that, to, to jump that. I work in a project, which was soft engineering uh, project, which I uh, uh, probably David mentioned, uh, Gerald Essring. I don't know if you if you know him at that time. and uh, a wonderful person. And then I end up working with another. During my PhD, I had one dissertation with another person. So, uh, uh, and that was okay. So changing uh, your, don't think that you, once you're gonna go to that, you are stuck with one person. Uh, the department usually provides that environment that you can change your mind and change your interests as you go along. And that, that at least worked for me. Great, thank you for your answers. Um, and maybe as our last question, um, since we're running low on time, um, is there a good way to optimize your career during graduate school to go into academia post-graduation versus going into industry? And um, how does postdoc experience play into both of those things? These are really good questions. <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, I, I would just strongly encourage you to do an internship in industry while you're a grad student. Uh, there's there's a lot of it kills several birds with one stone. It can be they can act as le outside letters of recommendation. Somebody outside your university doing it give you an idea to see what industry is like. Some people you know some people like being in university. Some people like being in a research lab. Some people like being in industry settings. There's there's advantages of all those. This helps you helps you figure that out. Um, I, like many PhD students, uh, weren't sure what they wanted to do. And uh, one of my sayings is, uh, I wouldn't accept any jobs at any place that didn't make me an offer. Okay, so uh, it's hard to figure that in advance. But when you graduate and you have, you know, you have concrete offers in your hand, either university offers or industry offers, that's an easier decision than you know you know the abstract i could work at any university at any company um i would think these days it would be pretty hard to come up with a dissertation that would lock you out of industry uh or lock you out of universities i mean i see what the other people think i i think it's a very late binding decision you just should get some experience in industry to because you're going to know what academia is like right you spent your whole life there to get some experience in industry to see if that's what you want because not everybody is equally successful at everything but you would need to see what you prefer how what you enjoy and i don't know how to figure out industry without some experience in it so doing an internship in industry is extremely useful because it gives you a some experience in terms of what do people actually care about because what we publish in academic conferences may not be the stuff that people actually care about. It gives you a different perspective. It gives you a different look at the scale of problems. And the other thing is, it really enables you to make contact to other people that have a different perspective. And, certain, and a lot of times certain things actually started to matter more or less 
once people come back from their research internship. Now, at the same time, trying to figure out whether you want to go to academia or whether you want to go to industry fairly early on enables you to kind of say, oh, maybe I should be focusing on a more applied project, a more abstract project. Maybe I should focus on two or three additional publications. Um, I need to make sure that some of the projects have certain amount of depth versus uh, some of the other ones. You may not need that. That has an impact and can make some decisions as you go along on graduate school. It also depends on whom, where you focus your kind of a networking effects on. For example, do you go to RIPE and NANOC to kind of get to know people that are running operational networks fairly early on? Or do you focus on SICOM uh, and some of the other conferences? Do you, whom, where do you do your networking? So trying to figure out some details on what you want to do may be useful, but it definitely is not a must. For example, I certainly didn't know what I wanted to do, whether it would be academia or research lab or industry after my PhD. And I was very happy at at and Research, but then when it came up, the chance to actually go into academia in Germany, hey, I jumped on it. Have I regretted it? No, certainly not. I've been enjoying myself. But I'm also sure I would have very much enjoyed staying at an academic research lab if we had just been able to move at t Labs research to Germany to kind of have a certain big advantage of the kind of infrastructure that I certainly enjoy over here. Yeah, I'll just add, I think I wouldn't, wouldn't draw the distinction so much industry versus academia. I would say research versus a non-research oriented role. And I think, um, I think David hit the nail on the head that there's very little difference in uh, if you do research that would help you get an academic job, it'll also help you get an industry job. The reverse may not be the case. And in particular, I think there, you know, it's unclear exactly what a dissertation is. I mean, you could view it as two or three big technical papers and the extent to which those papers are related to one another or build on each other or are bigger than the sum of their parts uh, plays a big role in how suitable one is uh, on the academic market. And it can sometimes matter less on a, on a not for a non-research job. If you've done sort of three projects that are sort of loosely connected and each individually interesting, that might not be an impediment to, to a good uh, non-research job, but it can be an impediment to a research job. And likewise, sometimes students will stay a little longer in the PhD, as Anya mentioned, to get a few more papers under their belt or to have their work gel to make that the whole more than the sum of its parts because it ends up being important for being having an effective job talk and being effective in informing your own research agenda as an independent researcher after graduation, whether it's at an industrial lab uh, uh, or in academia. But the one thing to also keep in mind is there are lots and lots of graduate students in networking. There are only a small number of academic positions available. So don't say, oh, I failed because I didn't get an academic position, rather the opposite. I think one of the good things about networking is there are tons of jobs out there that will be fun where all your skills that you learn during your PhD will be useful. So we all succeed by learning and by being able to actually explore in depth some research topic. And that is what the PhD is all about, I think. Yeah, let me, let me uh, second that one. Uh, I, I ended up in academia. That worked great for me. I, I'm surprised I ended up as a professor. <laughs> I, I'm surprised I got a PhD even. Uh, if you hear my, uh, I give a life story talk and I'm surprised I went to graduate school. I'm surprised I studied computer science. That, that was not, not the plan. You don't quite know how this is, uh, this is all gonna turn out. If, if you went to graduate school saying, I, I'm gonna be a professor of computer science. I mean, that's setting yourself up. Uh, at a, I'm gonna be a professor of computer science at a major research institution. You know, that's, that's a tough target. That's really hard to call. I mean, that might happen, but you know, what's we're, we're fortunate. You, you are getting PhDs in a field where if you don't get an academic position, you're not going to be a taxi cab driver, right? There are you, there'll be people in graduate school that if they don't get an academic position, you know, if they're in English or some of these other things, backup is taxi driver. Okay. You're, you're going to have a wonderful, high paying, interesting job if you don't end up in, in academia. And you could have even more impact 
uh, you know, much more, you, you could have a more successful career than many academics if you end up in industry. So that would be the only thing I, I would, you know, uh, that be, be flexible on what su success looks like uh, for your career. And, you know, it, you're in a, an amazingly, you know, what other field is going to have more impact on this century than computer science, artificial intelligence? This is going to be an am amazing ride, but don't, don't have only academia as the only poten potential outcome here, because that's really hard to control. Uh, for me, now when I give my talk, I would not be in academia. <laughs> I know two people who, Hennessy would not be at Stanford, and I would not be at Berkeley if this other guy in computer architecture before us had taken the jobs. He had a job offered at Xerox Park, Stanford, and Berkeley. He, he picked Xerox Park, which is a research lab, and if he'd gone to Stanford, I don't think Hennessy would have joined Stanford. If he'd gone to Berkeley, I know I wouldn't have gone to Berkeley. So that was completely out of my control. That was all up to him. <laughs> Wherever he wanted to go, uh, I wasn't, wherever he went, I wasn't going to go there. And so that, I, there's nothing I could do about that, right? And uh, I, 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 I'm, thank God <laughs> he, he went to Xerox Park. <laughs> but, you know, th th this is uh, beyond your control. So, uh, but there's all kinds of wonderful jobs uh, out there. That's, you're going to get a wonderful job that uh, everybody, you know, your parents are going to be proud of <laughs> no matter what, what you do. Uh, but it may not be, you know, uh, a professor at Princeton. You know, that, that's, those are kind of rare opportunities there. So I keep that in mind. In, in my case, I, I knew that I want to go to academia. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. But I had an opportunity to work in a research lab after I graduated. So I decided to go to a research lab. And it was very nice. I saw another world, another different way of, of uh, doing things. And that shaped up my career uh, for the rest of my life. And I, uh, I, I'm really glad that I made that, uh, that choice. But one point of advice that no matter if it is academia or a research, do something that you like. That's what you, you need to focus. Uh, uh, and you don't have control over everything. Things happen and you don't have control, as David said. What is important is when you look yourself, is, am I having fun? Am I enjoying what I'm doing? You don't do something that's nice if you're not enjoying what you're doing. So that's the most important point. If you are in academia or research or any other job, do something that you like because you are enjoying to do. Don't look for, I, I say, don't go after the money. Go after being, uh, uh, doing something that you like to do every day. That's my yeah, when, when I give my, when I give my uh, advice talk, uh, one of the things I say, the first thing I say is I made decisions for personal happiness rather than personal health. Wealth, personal, not health, wealth. Health is important too, but wealth versus happiness. I always picked happiness. And I'm at the end of my, well, I'm at the end, end of my academic career. I'm on my second career now. But what was wrong with that? Why, what was the bad thing about picking happiness over wealth, right? Because there's a lot of, in America, you think wealth equals happiness, but there's a lot of unhappy, wealthy people, right? And so they actually, what over my career, psychologists always used to just study crazy people. But like 20 years ago, hey, here's an idea. Let's study normal people and see what makes them happy. So there are now books on happiness based on research in what it takes to be happy. And but I, I would absolutely agree. I mean, the, the best case you can do is find something you love to do and somebody pays you to do it. That's a that's a that's going to be a pretty happy life. The other things, you know, work-life balance, having a family, you know, uh, having a spiritual side, you know, having fun, but you can actually study what it takes to be happy. But uh, if you're fortunately, I mean, there's a lot of people who don't have this choice, right? There's a lot of people uh, whose jobs are, they hate their jobs, right? They, they have to earn a living. But if you're getting PhDs in computer science, you're, you're not having to, to make those choices. And you should be at some place where you're happy being, you know, looking forward to going to work and, and being there. And, you know, you're very fortunate to be able to do that. But if you're, if you got a PhD and you're working somewhere, you're unhappy, then you're not doing it right. 
And keep in mind, if somebody accepted you as a grad student in computer science, they believe you can do the PhD. So actually go ahead and do it. And, and the other thing that I'd say from, you know, my towards the, you know, later in my life uh, thing is one of the best things that happened. I went to retirement seminar seminar and, you know, I looked at the statistics and I'd say, well, if I lived to my 80s, that would be pretty good. And she said the number one characteristic of a long life is education. That's what it's correlated to. And I think it's because you're more conscientious about things. So she said, uh, and so I thought I lived in my 80s. So that talk, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna live to my 90s. All of you are gonna live, you're gonna see 100. You're gonna live to 100. So, you know, taking an extra few years to get a PhD, there's no super PhD. They're not like, there's PhD and double PhD. There's none of those. So PhD is the last thing you can get. So if you take, five-ish years to get a PhD, that's just a wonderful investment because you're going to have a, you could have a 50, 60 year career and still have 20 years of retirement because you guys are going to live forever. You know, you're going to live into, to, you're going to live a long, you're going to have a long time uh, to live. So make sure you, you know, do something you love and uh, take it, give yourself that opportunity. Right. There's just one thing and that is in certain countries. The PhD time is limited by the funding time, which may be two, three years, like in France or so. So at that point, you cannot quite extend your PhD that fast. And at that point, the postdoc time is actually one of the things that helps you. And the postdoc time can also help you when you need to, when you want to kind of gather additional experience in additional research group, when you want to get additional advice, when you want to make sure that your work gels out, uh, advances a little bit more. So. Don't say no to postdoc time. It can be a great chance of actually getting more time to grow before you, your tenure clock is actually starting. Yeah, I, they didn't really have postdocs when I did it, but it seemed like a really cool job to me. You, you're not worrying about your dissertation and you don't have the responsibilities of a professor. It seemed, wow, that's pretty cool. I think if that's what I'm doing right now. I'm a postdoc, that's what I think. I'm an individual contributor. I don't have to finish my dissertation. I get to work, pick what I work on. So I think postdocs really pretty cool. Uh, I I didn't actually do one. Uh, did anybody here do a postdoc? Oh, okay. <laughs> Was it cool? <laughs> it basically allowed me to move from the theory group into the networking part. And wow. So I basically switched from doing algorithms, which I did uh, do my PhD on, and I got my uh, postdoc on the theoretical computer science area at at t Labs and went into networking and at the end uh, got a professor in networking. So that's how it I changed moved to theory it, to networking. It changed your career. So yeah, that's a that's a great story. And you meet a lot of people all over the world. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I, I think on that yeah. we can. Kind of I think I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we want to thank the panel very much for, for your time. Um, we also want to thank the audience. There are so many questions that were posted, and they're just so amazing. And we're sorry we don't have time to answer them all. Um, but we want this conversation to continue. We encourage everybody to go on the Slack and keep asking questions. And uh, if you're able to help us answer other people's questions, that's that's really helpful as well. Um, and finally, we want to remind you that this is a this is a talk series that we're doing, and we plan to have other panels and other talks in the future. So if you have ideas for panel topics and speakers that we should invite, we encourage you to let us know. Um, but on that note, uh, you know, thank you very much, everyone, and we want to wish you uh, the best of luck in your graduate studies. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.